In this video, we're going to have a look at all the tools and technologies you need to be proficient with to be a successful DevOps engineer in 2021. So the first practical skill that you're going to want to pick up is a programming language. There's a lot of different programming languages out there, but when it comes to DevOps, Python, Node, and Ruby are always common options. Now, if you don't know any of these languages and you're looking to pick up one, my suggestion is to go with Python. It's going to be the easiest one to pick up. It's definitely the most popular nowadays, and it allows you to build tools and applications really quickly, which is really important when it comes to DevOps. Now, when it comes to learning Python, there's literally hundreds of different resources out on the internet that you can use. My suggestion is to pick a book, maybe watch a couple of videos on YouTube, and then to start building your own scripts and applications. Python's a pretty simple programming language to learn, but you're not really going to get proficient at it unless you're building your own projects. So building your own web scraper or something like that is a great way to start. Up next, we have source control and source control is more important than ever nowadays. This is a skill set that you should be picking up as you're learning your programming languages and DevOps tools. Everything is code nowadays. You've probably heard the term infrastructure as code. So it's really important to understand source control and and how we can store changes to scripts as well as our infrastructure configurations. Now there's two main things that you should understand with source control. There's the get versioning tool and then we have the code repositories, the most popular one being GitHub of course. And if you're in the IT field you've probably run into it before. But to really understand all the concepts with them you just need to integrate them into your own projects and get as much exposure as possible. The next key concepts that you're going to need to understand is the fundamentals of operating systems. And when it comes to DevOps, Linux really is king. And I say that coming from a Windows background myself, I'm actually a Microsoft certified systems engineer. And from what I'm seeing in the industry, even companies that are Microsoft focused, Microsoft shops in the past, they're introducing more and more Linux into their environments. So when it comes to Linux, the key concepts that you need to understand is first the bash shell. It's very important to be comfortable in the bash shell and just know how to get things done. Know how to install software, know how to open up ports, know how to check to see if a port is open, various system administrative stuff like that. The next thing that you need to be familiar with is the Linux file system. You need to be able to understand the Linux file system permissions and how to set them, and you also need to be familiar with the directory structure. You should be able to name off all the directories within a Linux file system and be able to name the function of each of these directories. The last key component of the basics of Linux comes with SSH and understanding SSH key management. Since DevOps is an operations role, you could potentially be managing thousands of servers and just understanding SSH key management is just really a bare minimum requirement. Moving on to networking. Now, when it comes to networking, the more you know, the better. But these are the key concepts that I think you need to understand as a bare minimum when starting out in DevOps. The first component is DNS resolution. Most services rely heavily on DNS name resolution to work properly. You need to be comfortable with how DNS name resolution works, as well as the tools that you use to troubleshoot DNS problems. The other basic concepts that you need to understand is just basic networking. You need to understand what a subnet is, what a gateway is, and then you need to be familiar with concepts like DHCP and network address translation. For protocols, the one that you're going to be using the most is definitely going to be HTTP, so you'll need to have a good functional understanding of how it works. After you understand those various topics, I would then dive into firewalls, load balancers, and proxy servers. For firewalls, you should understand the difference between incoming traffic and outgoing traffic, what a stateful firewall is, as well as what a non-stateful firewall is, and then like what the difference is between a layer 3 firewall versus a layer 7. Load balancers are pretty self-explanatory. When it comes to load balancers, probably the most important takeaway is understand the types of load balancing algorithms that are available. For example, you have round robin, weighted round robin, lease connections, resource base, and just having a fundamental understanding of the differences of those queue types is really important to understand. For proxy servers, you're going to want to be familiar with what the traffic flow to a proxy server looks like and the difference between a forward and reverse proxy. The next section is cloud. So there's currently three different major cloud providers. 
and you really just need to understand at least one of these providers. Once you have the basic understanding of how one of them works, it's very easy to pick up the tools that the other ones use. They all use similar concepts, it's just the naming and interfaces that are a little bit different. So my advice is just to pick one and stick with it. And the best way to just pick one is if you're already employed, find out which one your employer uses and use that one. If you're not currently employed or you're still a student, then go out and look at the job openings that you're interested in and find out that way which platform they're looking for experience in. When it comes to learning these platforms, experience is definitely the king. So once you've chosen your platform, the next step is to get the experience. All these platforms provide a free tier or trial tier where you can go out and test the basics of them. So what I would do is just bring up your own project, maybe host your own website on one of these platforms, and that's going to be the best experience you can get. Don't worry about taking a course or getting certified right away. Experience is king when it comes to these providers. Infrastructure as code. So this is a huge buzzword that's been picking up more and more momentum over the years, and that's with good reason. Systems and environments can get pretty complex and they always drift away from how they were originally designed. In the real world, it's expected that documentation gets updated and everyone's in line with the different changes that happened over the years, but that's rarely the case. And when it comes to troubleshooting these environments, you really have no idea how they're actually created. You're really just depending on some outdated Visio diagram and how some engineer said it was supposed to be set up. So the goal of infrastructure as code is to codify the entire infrastructure. And this really helps the operations and development teams to understand what what's actually in place and what changes are actually made. So the next sections of this video are really dedicated to help you learn and understand how to make infrastructure as code a reality. So the first concept we're going to hit on are containers. Containers are becoming more and more popular everywhere in the IT world, and it's really just a key component that you need to understand when you're getting into DevOps. When it comes to learning containers, the tool that I recommend starting out with is Docker. So when it comes to understanding containers, just understand that that they are environments that you create that your software can run on. These containers are super lightweight, much more lightweight than say a virtual machine. And they're also very easy to transfer. For example, if I build a Docker container on my Windows machine and then transfer that Docker file over to a Linux server that's on a totally different architecture and operating system, Docker can take that container, interpret it, and create the environment for the application to run on. So that's a very simplified explanation of what containers are and what they can do for you. When it comes to Docker and containers, I really recommend taking some practical training and learning them from the bottom up. I have a course that I do on Docker that I will link to. It's completely free. Just keep in mind that it was one of my first videos that I created, so the sound quality isn't as good, but the content in my mind is great, and it's really going to teach you the key concepts that you need to know and understand for Docker. The next concept you need to be familiar with is container orchestration. Think of your workload as an orchestra. Each container is like a musician responsible for their own workload. Each of these musicians are looking to the conductor for guidance. Kubernetes is like the conductor to the orchestra. Let's have a look at a real world example. We have three servers available to us. Kubernetes is installed on all the servers and forms a cluster. We then take our containers and organize them into what's called pods. Pods contain one or more containers. In our example, we we have two pods, each containing three containers of a web application. One is for the production instance of the application, while the other is for the development instance. Through Kubernetes, we can assign pods to the worker nodes. Kubernetes makes sure that the workload is distributed throughout the nodes. If any of the nodes go offline, Kubernetes can make sure the workload is moved to another node. When it comes to Kubernetes, there's a lot to know and learn. Before you get started, you'll need adequate knowledge of Docker and containers. After that, the best suggestion is to create your own lab environment. You can either create your own three node cluster or you can install Minikube, which allows you to virtualize a three node cluster on a single server. If you're looking for a more simple option just to get your feet wet with container orchestration, you may want to look at Docker Swarm. It'll allow you to get your feet wet without going into all the complexities that come with Kubernetes. To truly have infrastructure as code, we need to provision our servers and network as code. That's where tools like Terraform come in. 
Terraform is a tool for building, changing, and versioning infrastructure safely and efficiently. It allows you to completely codify your infrastructure by creating a plan file. This plan file allows you to create, change, or remove components of your infrastructure no matter what cloud provider you're using. Terraform is also an idempotent tool. And in DevOps, this is a term that you should be very familiar with. That means it's aware of the current state of your system and it will only make the changes that it needs to. Terraform is definitely a tool that's going to see more frequent use in the upcoming years. So once you have your infrastructure provisioned, the next step is to make sure that everything is configured. And that's where configuration management tools come into play. When it comes to configuration management, the most popular tools out there right now is Ansible, SaltStack, Puppet, and Chef. If you're just getting started out in DevOps and you haven't used any of these before, my recommendation is to look straight at Ansible. This is definitely the best option to use for configuration management. In my opinion, it beats all the other options in every category, but the most important one in my mind is the ease of setting it up for an entire infrastructure. If you use something like Chef or Puppet, you need to get a client agent on each of your devices that you're managing. But with Ansible, you just need to make sure that you have a working SSH connection, which you usually do by default. This also lets you manage a wide range of different types of devices. For example, it's very easy to manage network gear like routers and switches using Ansible, where using something like Chef and Puppet would be very difficult since there wouldn't be an easy way to install the client software on those devices. Continuous Integration and Continuous Delivery, or CI-CD for short. Continuous Integration is the act of automating the QA of new code. When a new commit comes into a code repository, a CI tool can automatically launch it in a container and run tests. If the tests fail, the developer is notified and they can have a look at their code and fix it. If the tests pass, then you can move on to the continuous delivery portion, which will automatically deploy the code. The code can be delivered to any environment, either QA, staging, or even production. The act of using CI-CD pipelines helps automate the testing and delivery of code, saving a lot of developer time. Some of the common tests performed by CI tools include linting, the process of checking code to make sure it's formatted to a certain standard. No more arguing about tabs versus spaces. Dependency checks. And this could be something like a Python script requiring a certain module and then that module not being added to the requirements.txt file. A CI test would fail this code. Unit tests. You know those fun things that you had to program in your college university courses? They're finally coming into use. Architecture tests. You could have your code run in different types of containers or architectures and see if it runs properly in all of them. When it comes to the tools of CI-CD, there's a lot of different choices and you can't really go wrong with any of them. You'll just have to have a look at each of them and just see which one works out the best for you. Just like in this video, in IT, monitoring and log management is somewhat of an afterthought. However, recently, more and more companies have been embracing proper data analytics and log management. If you do find yourself in a DevOps role, you'll probably find yourself having to learn one of these many tools for log management and data analytics. My only real advice here is to go out there and check to see what's available and maybe play with them in your lab environment and see what you can do. I've done a couple of videos showing off Grafana and InfluxDB, so some practical labs like that might be beneficial. But other than that, if you're just getting into DevOps, I would focus more on the beginning topics of this video, the Linux fundamentals, the networking, programming, and of course, infrastructure as code. If you found this video helpful at all, please go ahead and hit that like button. Other than that, if you're looking to learn more about DevOps, programming, or just anything IT in general, go ahead and check out my channel. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope Hope to see you all in the next video.